Namo tasa makhawato arahato samma samputthasa Namo tasa makhawato arahato samma samputthasa Namo tasa makhawato arahato samma samputthasa Uthang thamang sangkang kunutarang upacayang nama sami. <coughs> one of my favorite exercises and one that I'm going to share with you and recommend you, you um, try for yourself, is to imagine you have a guest from Mars or Venus or any other planet really, but the idea being that this is someone from another planet who is very intelligent but knows nothing at all about um, this world and our life in it. And that you then have to explain your life and the things you do and the things around you and why they things are the way they are to this um, visitor from Mars. It's a very good way of um, questioning, re-examining, recognizing uh, all that you take for granted. And <clears throat> this uh, came to mind earlier on this afternoon, uh, speaking with some students. And <clears throat> one of the students um, said, I hear that you, you, know, you keep an awful lot of rules, is that true? And, and I said, yes, I mean, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of rules. Um, but um, it doesn't seem um, like a, um, it's not a pressure upon me to do that, or I don't feel that it's um, constricting me in any way. And <clears throat> to, to clarify this point, um, I suggested this imaginary guest or friend from Mars and said, let's say you set yourself the task of explaining to this um, Martian um, all about driving a car. You know, what is a car? How do you drive it? And what are the conventions involved? Uh, what are the do's and the don'ts? And I think that before very long you realize you were, you were describing um, a huge number of rules. Um, every time you drive a car, you keep so many rules. Some of them are backed up by the laws of the land and the highway code. Others are more conventions or enable you to drive uh, more safely or more uh, effic efficiently or effectively. But I, I, would, uh, I would doubt whether everyone, anyone feels that when they drive a car, they're ta taking on a huge number of rules and regulations which are very um, constricting and, and suffocating. And this is how um, a monk feels about his discipline or a nun. He feels the same way that you would feel about driving a car. Um, another analogy that I'll share with you um, is that of a musician playing, let's say, a, um, a concerto by one of the great composers, say Beethoven or Mo Mozart or whoever. And we, we are very um, impressed and appreciative of the skill and the creativity of the musician, violinist or pianist or whatever. And we rarely, I think, um, consider that every single movement of the musician's fingers or whatever he's using, his, his lips, his lungs, or whatever, um, was laid down by, is, is determined by someone who died um, to 300 or whatever years ago. Again, 
Um, I bring this up as an example because I think it's, very, it's a clear example of someone who is putting forth effort in a way which is dependent on um, conforming to a number of um, huge number of conditions voluntarily and yet rather than um, feeling um, diminished by that uh, feels that it's the most um, beautiful expression of his freedom as an artist or as a creator, and similarly for all those who listen. <clears throat> so this understanding of um, sila and morality is, is very important and central to our understanding of our practice as Buddhists. The path of practice, traditionally um, formulated in terms of the Eightfold Path, <clears throat> is often abbreviated into three kinds of training or education, or sikha. First, the training or education of conduct, training or education of the heart, training education of our understanding of life. So the, uh, the Buddhist teachings are then, I would argue, fundamentally, uh, they fundamentally form fundamentally an education system rather than a belief system. And this, uh, for this reason, I, uh, I would say that uh, we could argue, or I would argue that Buddhism is a universal religion in that uh, most um, belief system religions um, find it impossible to avoid uh, division between us and them. We who have the correct set of beliefs and everyone else who does not, and then are faced with the dilemma of um, how do you behave towards people who've got it all wrong and are going to suffer for eternity because of that lack of faith. Do you try to persuade them? Do you try to force them? Do you ignore them? This is a major dilemma, I think, for anyone who takes a belief system religion seriously. In Buddhism, uh, we say what you, what you believe is not so important about how you live your life. And those conditions um, that promote or lead to rebirth in a heaven realm are such things as kindness, um, generosity, integrity, compassion, and so on. All those virtues um, are the driving force that leads to a favorable rebirth and ultimately to freedom from the whole cycle of rebirth. And for this reason, um, wherever a Buddhist sees goodness and kindness and compassion and generosity and integrity and honesty, Buddhist rejoices because that person is creating the conditions for happiness for themselves in this life and in future life, uh, completely independent, irrespective of whether they may be call themselves or consider themselves Christians or Muslims or Mormons or Hindus or, or whatever. The religious label, the beliefs are secondary to conduct, to inner and outer conduct. So uh, Buddhism, on the, for this reason, is, has never been um, an evangelical religion. But it's one in which um, Buddhists seek to support the creation and the growth of goodness in whatever society they find themselves and, and are tolerant of those of different beliefs. 
um, in the midst of their own uh, countries and communities. So Buddhism is, um, as they say, essentially a training or an education of the whole of our life. And it is not merely um, you know, a cultural identity. Um, that is um, a sad waste of a human life if um, we take on Buddhism merely as an external form, but don't embark upon this education with which the Buddha bequeathed us. So in this threefold training, or education of sila, of the heart, and of uh, wisdom. It's important to understand that this is what we these days would call a holistic um, education. That is to say, it's not step by step, or that you can't take one part of the education and develop it out of context. Indeed, in the practice of sila, or the conduct, the education, or training uh, of conduct, the, um, the heart and wisdom education is always there in the background. It's just that in certain circumstances, the sila, or um, education of conduct, or what's generally referred to as morality, takes the leading role. And the other two elements are, are in a supporting role. In the, those most Buddhist students, those of you, most of you will know that the second uh, leg of this, or, or um, element of this training, is usually called samadhi. But it's important to um, understand here that the word samadhi as the second of the three kinds of education is used in a different sense um, to that used in sama samadhi, the eighth um, leg of the, it's part of the Eightfold Path, where it refers specifically to um, the um, inner tranquility and clarity and stillness and stability of mind produced by uh, meditation practice. In the threefold training, this word is used to cover all of the um, different um, elements of the education of the heart. So all the ways in which we, we, we seek to deal creatively and effectively with negative mental states uh, such as anger and lust and greed and uh, jealousy and depression and anxiety and fear and so on and how we cultivate all the wholesome mental states of kindness and compassion and contentment and patience and resilience and, and um, effort and so on and so forth. So samadhi is an umbrella term in the threefold trainings rather than a specific technical term uh, referring to meditation. And so for this reason, I, I prefer to use the training of the heart rather than samadhis to avoid any misunderstanding. But in that training of the heart, education of the heart, then the training in morality and in wisdom or understanding is also present, but in a supporting role. The development of wisdom, the sila and the samadhi, the morality and the training of the heart are also present in a supporting role. It's just a difference of um, prominence and um, whichever area of the training um, is, um, is appropriate, most appropriate at any particular moment. So this is a very, um, uh, unusual um, attitude to morality um, when we compare it with the um, usual idea of, of, of morality as conforming to a set of rules um, laid down by um, a, a deity uh, which are uh, backed up by a system of reward and punishment. 
in in uh, in Buddhism, then we have the uh, recognition that we, as human beings, we cannot, um, through an act of will, prevent um, unkind, cruel, jealous, nasty thoughts from arising in our mind, and we'd go crazy if we if we thought we should full of guilt, uh, because it's not something that is possible. But what we can do, and it's not um, too high, uh, too, too um, idealistic a standard at all, is that we can make a commitment to not expressing those kinds of volition in our actions or speech. So we're, when we take precepts, informal precept ceremonies, the, the lay Buddhists request the precepts from the monk. This is very important because it has to be voluntary. This is an expression of the voluntary nature of this education. Each of the precepts, uh, when translated um, accurately into English, involves a phrase, I undertake. Um, the education of my conduct um, involved in abstaining from harming or hurting or stealing or sexual misconduct or whatever. So it's a commitment to an education. And once we have that commitment to an education of our conduct, then it's a standard that we, we have with us and forms what I call a peg for mindfulness. It enables us to awaken to um, how we are acting, the quality of our actions in daily life. It enables us to refrain from certain actions and to act in other ways. Now, the, um, the, the goal of this education, the immediate goal, is to create trust and warmth and stability and a sense of safety in communities, beginning with families and going all the way up to the larger um, society. Now, if in, a, if in any kind of community, if we humbly recognize that ourselves and those around us may well on occasions be angry and upset and, um, and be greedy and jealous and all these things, and we don't expect that they shouldn't be or don't think that we should not be that way, and yet, um, we can take responsibility for our actions. And we are confident that those around us will do that also. We feel safe. Uh, we don't have to be uh, always on our guard. We don't have to be uh, defensive and protective and suspicious. Um, we relax. We feel good because we trust those around us. So when you see the beauty of trust in any kind of relationship, from a relationship between in a couple, uh, between a man and woman, a man and man, woman and woman, whatever, between two people, or in a family, or in a community, as soon as there's that sense of trust, then you have something very stable and, and worthwhile. And that sense of trust doesn't come by itself. It comes um, immediately when we have a shared voluntary commitment to creating certain boundaries for your actions and speech and in saying this is my choice and i want to train myself in this way so keeping precepts is concerned is uh, considered to be bun or punya is merit because you're giving um you're giving harmlessness to the world, you're enabling people to feel safe and valued and loved because um, you are taking responsibility for your actions and speech and, and making that intention not to, um, not to shout and to steal and to be aggressive and, and, uh, and to hurt those around or to hurt yourself. Now, internally, the, um, the important 
feature of Buddhist morality is as an education training, then there are also certain other uh, features that must be fulfilled. One is that there is no gaining attitude in mind. You're not keeping precepts in order to get something, whether it might be a, um, a present moment um, reward um, of praise or respect or status or heavenly reward in the future. So here is where the training of the heart comes in very clearly. It's not just keeping precepts, but you have to constantly be uh, reflecting and protecting the heart from any gaining ideas that might arise. And secondly, um, the Buddha said that if you um, lead a careful and, and um, um, restrained and respectful life, you keep precepts, um, and then on, uh, on the grounds of that pure sila, you look down on others who behave badly and you consider yourself superior to them. By that very idea, by that very, or indulging in that idea and, and welcoming that idea, your sila is sullied. So the moment that you take this, um, I'm better than they are because of my pure sila, your pure sila becomes impure. First, so it's, it's, a, it's a subtle training of the heart as, as well as of conduct. The result which um, we, uh, we aspire to is that through um, experiences in which we are under pressure or we are tempted to act or speak um, badly or unwisely, and we are nevertheless able to maintain our commitment to precepts, um, we feel a sense of self-confidence, and we start to feel we really like ourselves. So this sense of uh, self-respect and liking ourselves is uh, the Buddha suggests, I'm suggesting you don't take this obviously as an object of faith, but look at this, just how your perception of yourself changes. You like yourself. And if you're going to develop meditation um, in a way that leads to wisdom and liberation, you have to be good friends with yourself. Um, it doesn't work otherwise. And this is why sila is so fundamental. So you need uh, to, to keep sila, you need to have the right understanding, you need to understand why, e why breaking each precept uh, is a cause of suffering to yourself and to others. You have to see the beauty, the value of each precept and really aspire and want to keep the, keep the rule. And you need to be patient. Um, if you lack patience, even if you, um, you accept standard of conduct and you have some commitment towards it, but the moment you feel uncomfortable or bored or hot or cold or hungry or thirsty or tired, you forget it, then you're never going to go very far on the path. Patience is the supreme virtue in the Awada Patimoka and the key discourses that the Buddha gave. He gave it to the 1,250 fully enlightened monks and the year following his enlightenment. So this wasn't a teaching telling monks um, the path to Nibbana because they'd already um, reached that goal. So this was laying down the fundamental principles of the teaching so that those arahants could um, could use it as a framework in teaching in whatever um, part of Middle India or whatever part of the world they should wander to. And so the Buddha pointed to the Nibbana as being the highest goal, and of all the different virtues um, that would lead on that path, he singled out 
patient endurance, kanti, kanti paramanta po titika. Patience is the supreme incinerator of defilements. And it's worth, um, worth coming back to this teaching um, because it's not, it's not one that um, I think is um, emphasized enough. And uh, often, even even in communities of monks and meditation monks, you, uh, often patience is relegated to a kind of consolation prize. Um, you know, oh, I did this retreat or I did this practice. I didn't really get that much. Well, I guess I got a bit of patience out of it. You know, it's like better than nothing. You know, it's this consolation prize. Um, but patience is the prize itself. You know, if you're this is the, the Buddha's words, the development of patience is supreme incinerator of defilements. So that, that isn't, um, but again, uh, there is a proviso or, or uh, you recognize that you can never ever take one single virtue out and out of context. It's, it's this living organic um, training. So even patience is the supreme virtue but it also has to be governed by uh, wisdom. Um, many monks of my generation, you know, young Westerners, gung ho, we arrive in the jungles of Northeast Thailand, and we're going to go for it, you know, and uh, and uh, we all got to sit cross-legged and for hours on end, and never mind the mosquitoes, and we're going to do this, you know, and and a um, number of monks ended up having to go and have operations on their knees. Um, because they they were they were very uh, tough, you know, very highly motivated. Um, but that that's not all you need. You need a certain common sense and, and patience. And so, patience. What does patience mean? Well, one of the best definitions of this um, that I've come across is given by Gumpo Sumato, one of the uh, the senior monk in our tradition. And he said, patience is peaceful coexistence with the unpleasant. So, so patience doesn't mean you're gritting your teeth, you know, and just keep looking at the clock. I mean, that's not patience. That's not what the Buddha is talking about. It's being able to be at peace with something that you don't like or something you don't want or something that is unpleasant. So that sense of peaceful acceptance that, yeah, this is... Unpleasant. I don't like this, but I'm not going to allow my mind to be affected by it. I'm just being bearing with it. So that's an important uh, virtue. When I was uh, when I first arrived in Thailand in 1978, and uh, we the <clears throat> northeast Thailand is a very sticky. Um, uh, kind of climate has a very sticky kind of climate in you know and uh, some seasons you, when you walk you feel like you're like you're swimming through the air and it's um, and we have to sit on this concrete floor and I, when I first arrived I didn't speak the language of course and um, everyone has to sit papier you know in the the side uh, posture. And I'd been sitting cross-legged for a couple of years by then. And I was sort of all ready to go, but I'd never sat this like this pup. This is papier, very nice papier, and and it's really it, it's like if it doesn't feel balanced, you know, you just twist to one side. And before you've been sitting there very long, you know, you want to change, and you can't sit cross-legged, and you can't get up, and, you, and the mosquitoes are biting, and you, uh, you know, and you just have to be patient. Um, anyway, I'd, I'd, I'd hear these very long talks from Ajahn Chah and I, I couldn't understand anything. And then, you know, you just pick up this certain word you hear again and again. And I remember after the same time, there was a, a Western monk, Australian monk, who was like a Pi Liang, he's like a um, friend and mentor. And I said, um, you know, I'd, I'd like to start learning Thai as quickly as I can. If there are, if there's some words I hear, can I ask you? And he said, yeah. And he said, well, there is this word I, I just hear all the time, and uh, Ajahn Chah seems to say, oh, what's that word? Otton, what does that mean? Otton, otton. <laughs> and, and he said, that means patient endurance. And I said, oh, okay, now I understand. <laughs> yeah. So 
So being uh, being patient is a very important part of the training. And when you see this this overall uh, this training as this organic whole, as I said, you're training in in conduct and being bring a sense of care and attention uh, to the quality of your actions and quality of your speech, then you can learn so much. Um, the effort to 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 be mindful of speech is so illuminating. We have so many of the um, negative emotions express themselves in our speech, often without our being aware of it. And, and bringing that light of awareness onto speech uh, helps us to see our, our minds, our hearts much more clearly. And it's a very important part of the training. Now, the, 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 the aspect of Buddhism which is most immediately appealing uh, to many people is that of meditation, meditation practice. But the understanding of meditation practice um, tends to be uh, very narrow. People tend to think meditation is, you know, is that's what the real Buddhist practice is, and you sit with your eyes closed, or you walk up and down, that's, that's Buddhist practice. But in actual fact, the, what I would um, like to, to share with you is that the best framework for understanding Buddhist practice is in fact what we call the four right efforts. So let's um, look at a, me a typical meditation session. You know, what are you doing when you're meditating? Yeah, I mean, you're, you're putting attention on the breath or on a word or, or whatever. But looking at it slightly from a different angle, first thing you're doing is you're trying to sustain attention in such a way that negative mental states such as desires and aversions and laziness and, and dullness and agitation and doubts um, don't um, engulf the mind. And on those, uh, and when uh, that's not successful and you find you're meditating, you got sleepy or you're agitated or you've got all these thoughts about what you're going to eat when you leave here or um, and like it's going round and round in your mind, then you have to have uh, put forth effort, wise effort. You must have uh, strategies um, with which to deal with those hindrances, with those negative mental states that have arisen. So you're putting effort to protect the mind from negative mental states and to deal with negative mental states that have arisen you are also seeking to cultivate positive um, emotions. Obviously, mindfulness, clear comprehension, um, effort, contentment with the meditation object, um, and perhaps uh, uh, loving kindness or compassion. Most specifically, you're seeking to develop what we call the enlightenment factors, or the bojangas, or the jhana factors. So these are, uh, in meditation, the bojangas or enlightenment factors, the jhana factors are, are the wholesome um, mental states that you're seeking to cultivate. And when they have started to arise in the mind, your effort is to nurture them and to bring them to maturity. So meditation is effort. It's putting forth effort to protect the mind from unarisen um, negative mental states, um, to prevent their arising. It is the effort to deal with negative mental states that have already arisen. It's the effort to, uh, to create and to bring into the mind positive mental states that have not yet arisen, and to cultivate and to further uh, nourish and to bring to maturity those um, mental states, uh, positive mental states that have arisen. Now, in practice in daily life, and you know, well, oh, I just don't have any time to meditate. Life's so busy. You know, by the time I've uh, been on, uh, going to send a few messages with Line, and I've done my Facebook, and I've done this. You know, there's just no time left for meditation. Life's so busy, um, and the. 
you know, th this sense of frustration and maybe, oh, maybe I can, you know, take a few days off work and go off to a monastery or a meditation retreat and really get my practice together again. And, and uh, you know, if it wasn't for my husband, my wife, my work, my dog, my, then I would be peaceful, you know, so <clears throat> there's always someone or something to blame. But then if we just change our, our attitude and, and, and look at our practice in term of, terms of the four right efforts, we say, yeah, there's always whatever you are, wherever you are, whatever you're doing, whoever you're with, you can always put forth one of those four efforts. So um, in the morning, um, going to work, you know, preventing, uh, what, what are the unwholesome dhammas? that can easily arise in your mind during the day. You, know, you just think about this beforehand. Um, what do any negative mental states arise when you're driving to work? You know, when you're uh, in traffic jams or when somebody uh, drives in a very inconsiderate manner. Um, what's your usual mental state uh, on the way to work? Are there any negative mental states that tend to arise? So. How can you protect your mind against them? Or when you get to work or during the day, you know, and you, and you do get upset and, and hurt feelings and frustration and anger and tension, and what strategies do you have? What have you developed? What resources do you have to deal with those? Or do you just try to get away from them with, with some pleasure or just to forget? You see, I, now we, we have an unprecedented um, ability to escape from problems. And we have uh, a more, uh, uh, you know, uh, more and more atrophied and weaker and weaker capacity to deal with problems. In the moment we have even the slightest amount of boredom or anxiety or depression or something, you know, immediately we have, we have a way out smartphone um, or um, get in touch with somebody, have some kind of little hit of enjoyment or eat something, look at something. Or something. So seeing this in terms of, of rather short term and unsatisfactory um, and ultimately self-defeating um, means of escaping from life as it is right now. And we need to develop that ability to be in the present moment and to learn from life and to learn how to deal with all these negative mental states that arise. And, and the more you do it, then the better you get, the more experience you have, the more skillful means you have. Then how can I bring up, what kind of wholesome dhammas can I bring up in my, in my life? Well, patience, so I've got to go on a long meeting today or a long a long journey and, and um, yes, this really, rather than saying, oh, it's going to be so boring, it's going to be so hot, it's going to be so this and so that, and, you, and your mind's going round and round and all the things you don't like about, about what you've got to do today, and you just make yourself miserable, and you make yourself um, just a puppet or the prey uh, of what's going on. You, you don't take any responsibility. It's because things are like that, I'm like this. It doesn't follow. Yeah, things are like that for sure, not shutting our eyes to um, all the problems and the difficulties and the injustices and so on and so forth, not saying, never mind. Um, they're saying, right now, you know, what's the best uh, response? Or what's the best way to take care of my mind? So in, in busy um, social situations, like metta bhavana is really good. Like, sharing, spreading feelings of loving kindness. Now that's, that's a very um, flexible practice and one you can do almost anywhere. Please uh, uh, understand that loving kindness just doesn't mean, oh, may everybody be happy and just sort of spreading this kind of pink flowery cloud of love in all directions. Um, it's, uh, it doesn't work like that. It's not really possible. Um, because if, if it's the pink 
flowery um, hallmark kind of meta, you know, then uh, what happens when you see someone who's acting in a really nasty way? You know, it's just can't do it, and 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 you and you don't want to do it either. You know, it's like um, he's hurting other people. He or she is acting in a very un very selfish and aggressive and nasty way. Why on earth would I wish such a person to be happy? You know, um, can't do it. Don't want to do it. But that that's that's a misunderstanding of of metta. Metta means you wish it's a, it's caring for your own heart, but it's 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 a practice which must be imbued with wisdom. So if you see someone who's acting very aggressively, for instance, then you ask yourself, what specific, what kind of specific kind of well-being could I wish that person? Well, I, I wish that person could experience the happiness of a mind free from aggression. Or well, that person's very selfish, self-centered, egotistical. May that person know the joy of unselfishness. That person's so jealous, you know. May that person experience the happiness of sympathetic joy. See? So, you, so the, the particular mental trait, the particular behavior which you find so difficult to deal with, rather than being a bar to metta, it is what focuses the metta. You think, wouldn't it be wonderful um, if that person is always so critical, you know, knows the fault in everything and everybody and wants to tell everybody else as well from morning till night. But wouldn't it be so wonderful if that person could experience the joy of forgiveness and see the, the good side of people? And just imagine, oh, wouldn't that be wonderful? Oh, if only that person could realize that. And so immediately, you know, your mind was just so kind of harsh and resistant and, and upset and feeling, you know, why, what karma did I create in a past life that I have to live with people like this? You know? uh, or have to work with people like this? You know? um, then it becomes um, a vehicle for opening and See, everything is workable. This is the basic position. There's nothing that's not workable. It may not be complete liberation, but there's always something that you can do. It's just the, the, the interest and the commitment and the effort to see life as an education and to be educating ourselves in every area. So this is, everything um, is a challenge to this. Um, you know, it's so easy um, just to suffer and, and blame people and say, I'm miserable because he did this or she did that or this happened or um, I, um, uh, the other day I was in uh, Palo Alto and um, with a few people, all here and one or two others and, and we were, <clears throat> and this um, lady um, and she she recounted this really painful experience she had. It's an African American woman who had been on a meditation retreat. And meditation retreats tend to be like ninety ninety five percent middle class white people in America, don't they? And and so she was a black American woman, and uh, the med in the course of a guided meditation, the meditation uh, teacher made a comment which was disparaging of African-Americans. And she immediately sort of uh, came out of whatever state of karma. She was so hurt um, and so outraged by this um, that she still, you know, it was still affecting her now so quite some time afterwards. And the teacher did admit his fault and ask for uh, forgiveness, but still. So uh, I felt as a, as a male, uh, and you know, monk certainly, but but as a as a man, as someone who wasn't there and who's never experienced what it's be like to be an African American woman in a that kind of you know, I, it wasn't for me um, to to give her some advice. Um, but there was um, there were two elderly uh, African American women there, really very strong, um, impressive women, 
And one of them said, you know, I, uh, I was made, I was an orphan from the age of seven, brought up in an orphanage, but my, my grandfather used to come teach me sometimes. And he taught me something when I was a small girl that I never forgot. He said, girl, he said, there's nobody in this world better than you are. And you're not better than anyone else in this world. And she said that, I just remembered that all my life. And whenever I met the racial prejudice or people treating me meanly, I just remember that. And I thought that was such a wonderful, wonderful thing. And I thanked her, I said, I'm going to tell lots of other people about what you said today, so it will go, it will go further. And this is, um, it's not, I would say from a Buddhist point of view, um, it's not quite there. But it, it, it's, it's a very beautiful, a memorable thing to say. And she said it with such humility and such, it was so beautiful. Um, I was really glad that I was there to hear that. But from Buddhist point of view, to say, um, you would add, third point of view, that you're not on the same level as anybody else either. Because conceit, you, know, you can take, there's three kinds of conceit. I'm superior to you. I'm inferior to you, I'm equal to you. And it's that I'm equal to you, which, which is the one which we tend, especially in a sort of egalitarian society, uh, we don't tend to see as, as a form of conceit. But the moment that you set yourself up as something compared to others, then you're in the world of, of conceit. Now, the, the ability to come to the present moment you know, with a lot of this, just be in the now, you know, it's like be here now, as if it's uh, the goal. You can be here now, everything's going to be okay. You, know, you can eat an orange and you can do all these kind of things and be really happy. But the, the point is, what, what I would like to say is that the present moment is to carry on, expand on this education training analogy. The present moment is the classroom. Okay, that um, you learn about life um, in a direct, non-discursive, non-speculative, direct and life-transforming way when you can dwell awake, bright, clear, still in the present moment. And at that time, everything is teaching you. You learn so much. You observe so much. Understanding of of things which if you read in a philosophy a book of philosophy or, or something, you, you would think you'd close it after a page and you think this is too, I can't understand this. But when you're bright, awake, aware in the present moment, you learn this stuff. It's only when you try to articulate it afterwards, you realize, well, that's really profound. But at the time you don't, it's just kind of normal. And every, it's just this, it's just, then you realize, yeah, that's, that's really, I never thought about that before. Um, or I did, but it was, you know, as I've been saying since I came to the States, you know, the, 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 our community, as our communication, our ability to communicate with others uh, expands exponentially and is exploding, our communication with ourself uh, becomes poorer and poorer. Um, and, and we lack um, uh, this uh, awareness of what's going on. You know, we know the news, you know, what's happening in Thailand or what's happening in in England, something you know, within a flash, and yet things that are you know old news going on in our own heart and our own body, we still haven't heard it uh, because we're always looking elsewhere, always looking for something new, something more, something exciting, something stimulating, anything more. Um, and so, coming to the present moment, you know, the, we we begin to notice. Oh, yeah. Uh, you know, a simple thing. If you, you're in the present moment, and suddenly a, a thought pops up. And at that moment, you notice that the moment that a thought arises in your mind, there is no sense of a thinker. And that sense of being the thinker arises conditioned by the thought, not the other way around. Common sense says you have to have someone who thinks before you can think. It's obvious. But... Direct experience says that's not the case. There's a thought arising, conditioned phenomena, it's a trigger, thought arises, and then there's a sense of ownership. So, so is that true? Have you noticed that? 
Um, <clears throat> if you if you have, then suddenly a lot of this stuff about anatta and emptiness and all this kind of stuff which you've been reading about and and furrowing your brow about and thinking you maybe you understand. You say, ah, oh, that, that's that's it. You know, there's just this flow of phenomena. Uh, there's the um, uh, there's the uh, acqu acquisition of this flow and this sense of ownership and self and other that rises moment by moment. So, uh, you know, people of other religious traditions say, in Buddhist view, uh, when was the world created? How long ago? You know, do you you accept the Bible view of Few thousand years, or you and these sort of big bang people, or you know, when, and it was Buddhist. We say right now. This is when the world's created. It's created right now, and now, and now, and now. It's created moment by moment. We create the world, and for that reason, um, we don't. We realize that um, the creation of the world is not a fixed and necessary thing. We can transcend that, and this is the the liberation that the Buddhist training provides or can provide so it's not a it's not a teaching of adopting certain beliefs and attitudes and dogmas and and forcing all the doubts out of your mind um, and trying to reinforce the things that you believe so you feel safe and stable this is bringing your mind to the present moment um, and looking and observing and your interest in that and your ability to do it will be conditioned very largely by the care and the attention you give to the quality of your actions and speech in your relations with those around you and your families and your communities. Because when you, uh, you know, Thai, Thai people here, most of you will know that when people act in very immoral ways, they're drinking, they're gambling, it's a, they, the last thing they want to do is go and see a monk, you know, because they don't want to hear, because when you, you know, if you're acting and living in a very, you know, a monk gives a talk, he's, you know, it's like a dagger in your heart, and is it? And he's saying, he's, he's, he's telling me off. I know he is. I know, I know he knows all about me, and it's, it's that was for me <gasps> again. You see, so, so after a while, uh, people don't want to go and see monks and listen to dhamma talks, um, and that's just external, internally. The last thing you want to do is be with yourself. Um, if you're not acting well, you don't want to be with yourself, do you? Um, and how difficult it is to be with yourself anyway. I mean, in all, um, most, almost all civilized countries have uh, abolished um, capital punishment. Um, but in those countries that have, then the worst, what's the worst thing they can do to you? You know, the absolute horror is um, put you in solitary confinement. You know, to be with yourself. Is the is the most terrible punishment for for most human beings, and um, so it doesn't have to be. It's, it's quite the opposite. You know, learning to be with yourself and learning from experience um, is what gives you that real sense of a compass and a direction, and a sense of what's right and wrong, and good and bad, and wholesome and unwholesome. Not as a philosophy but it's something that is, uh, is an articulation of direct experience. So I would like to end my talk at this point. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> I say, just forget that. Um, it's it's not so late. So if anybody um, has any questions or would like to dispute and refute, <laughs> correct me, Clara. Yes. I, I don't have anything. I just have a. Sorry, I can't. Okay, yeah, I would just like to ask, um, what is the, in your opinion, what is the best time to meditate? Right now. That's <laughs> <laughs> the best time. Um, no, I, I, I think that the, the, excuse me, 
the best time to meditate is early in the morning, first thing in the morning. And a lot of people sort of lose their um, lose their enthusiasm for meditation because they tend to meditate before they go to sleep at night, and by which time you know they're they're run down and tired already, and they don't really. And it becomes just kind of like an empty ritual, and, and especially if they sit on their bed or anywhere near a pillow, and then after a while, and and then sitting meditation last thing at night without any any real foundation of meditation um, can lead to some very bad habits because you tend to get sleepy, and then you get into this habit of associating meditation with sleepiness. Um, so. Some kind of meditation before sleeping is 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 a good idea, definitely. Um, just to, for one thing, it'll prevent bad dreams, and you're relaxed, and you sleep better than if you're going to sleep very anxious and and stressed out. So it's a good thing. But the main meditation practice, I think, should be first thing in the morning because you're refreshed. You don't have anything, hopefully, very much in your mind, um, and Outside, it's it's quiet. It's good time, cool, good time to meditate. But uh, what's extremely important is that um, coming out of the meditation, you you observe the effects of the meditation on on your mind and heart during the day. Because if you start to observe that you feel a little bit more grounded, a little bit more patient, a little bit more forgiving, a little bit more present, and so on. Um, then you you start you get confident. Yeah, this is really worth worthwhile. This is worth um, giving some time to every day, and you begin to see some some definite changes taking place. So long term motivation, you know, you have to see some positive results from effort. And meditators often will 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 set the bar too high. You know, they want to see some sort of special. Um, experience, but come down a bit and just look in daily life. And if you're just a little bit more patient and kind and sensitive to others, and um, a little bit more aware of how your behaviour is, is impacting other people, that's a sign that that um, meditation is is starting to have some transformative effect on your life. Um, I would I would suggest to uh, also, at the beginning, to make some kind of a time um, uh, determination. So, to do this for three months every morning, whatever, and and keep keep a, a diary or a record. So, at the end of that, you can really see if there are any changes, and to, to really to give you that um, willingness to just to keep at it. Uh, because at the end, at the end of the day, as they say, it's it's more that constancy and just being very patient. And keeping at it every every single day, rather than what some people do, you get really enthusiastic, go on a meditation retreat, and yeah, and when I get back, I'm going to meditate every day, and and it's and it's like you know the clock, the watches people used to have before digital, you know, just sort of goes goes slower and slower and slower, and so you start off every day, and it's every two days, and then from an hour it's half an hour and twenty minutes, and you know. It's, it's, <laughs> and then suddenly it's it's all gone away. Um, so steady Eddie, you know, just keep keep very very. Uh, it doesn't have to be a long period of time, but uh, consistency um, is really key. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I had always thought that Conti was translated as forbearance, so that forbearance was the highest virtue. And I'm not sure what forbearance means, but maybe something like. Yeah, I, I, I actually um, prefer in my own works of translation I use forbearance, but but I would I would consider forbearance and patient endurance as meaning the, the same thing. I mean, some people, uh, particularly people who speak English as a second language, uh, kind of a bit puzzled by forbearance, and they don't because it's really a kind of um, Charles Dickens nineteenth century kind of word rather than one that many of us use these days, isn't it? Um, but but um, yes, but forbearance is. I would say whether we use patient endurance or forbearance, the 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 idea there, the essence of it is this uh, patient uh, or uh, peaceful coexistence with the unpleasant. And the other one, uh, samadhi, means 
those things that you said, I would have thought almost all the things you said would apply to stealing. You're behaving in those ways. The training of the heart is more like sila, like the right motivation. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I was trying to point out that these things are inseparable. Um, the, the 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 particular feature, the defining feature of sila, is the intention to refrain from certain actions and certain kinds of speech. So it's a volitional um, practice. So we recognize the 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 value and also the limitations of volition. They say, you know, we can. Um, say, no matter how angry I am with you, I promise you, I make a commitment, I would never hit you. I would never swear at you, even though I'm boiling inside. I'm not going to repress that. I'm going to be fully conscious of it, but I'm not going to um, express it. So this middle way between repression and expression. And so you, you, can, be, you can feel safe, because uh, I'm not going to hurt you that way. So this... But I can't say, I promise you, you know, I'm a good Buddhist and I'm going uh, to be kind and loving towards you, whatever you do and whatever you say in future, uh, because I want to uh, be a good Buddhist. That would be foolish, because you can't prevent the arising of negative mental states with volition. The, the sphere of for, you know, work for, for volition is action speech. Um, so in, for the role of uh, dealing dealing with negative mental states, then the key practice is cultivation of its opposite. So, in the case of anger, then cultivating loving kindness and developing a new habit in the mind. Um, and to um, one of the principles is if if we have a um, Let's say uh, if we put out a, a glass of milk for a cat, you know, and the cat um, doesn't, uh, and then the cat comes every day, and then one day you don't put the, uh, the milk out anymore, the cat still comes back a few times because you might change your mind. Or but eventually the cat realizes, no, no milk here, it goes somewhere else. Um, and so as the, on, the, on the sealer level, as we... Uh, refrain from the volition to harm again and again and again. That volition starts to atrophy because it's never um, it's never acted upon. And at the same time, from the inner, we are developing these thoughts of loving kindness and and and, um, and forgiveness. So working both from the outside and the inside together, then this uh, this um, negative mental state becomes extremely weak and then but to cut it off you need the wisdom on the level of vipassana to see it as uh, simply a mental state that arises and passes away um, as a condition rather than who you are so these three things work together in, in that way For, for prisoners for or non-meditators. Right. Yeah. But, uh, so, so um, why is the the emphasis practice, practice for the forest monastery is emphasis on being in isolation? No, I, I was pointing to the fact that for someone who has acted or acts in very um, unskillful and harmful ways, um, one of you know, some people say, or oh, you know, he, he's done bad things, and look, he's so rich and wealthy and famous, and um, come to a day, de, and, you know, and, and um, reject this uh, the law of karma. And, and the, the Buddha never said that you know acting immorally um, means that you're you won't ever get rich or famous or or anything. But one of the immediate results of unskillful action is that people find it almost impossible to be with themselves without distraction. So from, from the point of view of, of, of somebody in the world who has no spiritual aspirations, so what? But the moment that you have some kind of right view and you have that aspiration, then you say, that's horrible, that's a hell. So if someone who has that kind of mind is put in isolation, it's awful. 
But if you have pure sila and you're interested in meditation um, and observing your mind in, in, in great, with subtlety and detail, isolation can be um, wonderful. So it's whether or not it's voluntary and it's dependent on the person and the, uh, the intention. Um, so I mean, it's monks when they hear about people in solitary confinement, I could do that. <laughs> that wouldn't be so bad. <laughs> I mean, I, yeah. Um, I have a question about the pure sila. Let's say if you have a pure sila and then you're recognizing that other people is breaking the sila, you're you're not thinking that you're better, but you're just recognizing that there might not be a good person will that make your sila obsolete as well because i mean no it, it it's not that it, it makes it obsolete or completely zero you know nullifies the sila it, but it's an uh, imperfection or it it um d d sullies the sila you like um so it's it's a more subtle you know it's the next level of training but it, I really wanted to point out that, that sila is a very uh, complex and, and um, uh, integral part of this whole training or education. But the rec but in, I think in the West we have this whole idea about you know being non-judgmental. You know, it's like a a, a virtue which is considered um, very important. But in uh, in Buddha Dhamma we we would say yeah, if someone's acting in an unskillful way there is a recognition that person is creating really bad kamma. And so then we are like Brahma Viharas, you know, you don't want someone to be creating bad kamma, so you, you have compassion. And you think, is there something that I could do or to say to, uh, to, to make this um, person um, realize the foolishness of their action or to change? Um, is our relationship such that that person would listen to me? Um, what would be the right time and right place? What would be the right words? Um, and then maybe you get the, the you, you feel that yeah, this isn't that person is just not going to listen to me right now, and um, so you say, well, then I dwell in equanimity and just keep my mind calm, and then whenever anything changes and I can do something to help that person, then I will. So there's a distinction between saying thinking. Uh, I'm superior to that person, but uh, but if you have a recognition, oh, I'm so fortunate that I that I've heard this teaching and I'm practicing in this way, and and you feel sad and compassionate for someone who's still acting in ways that's making their own life very painful and making uh, and creating pain for those around them. But I mean, eventually, you don't want to think as you and me, right? Yeah, but that's that's the very highest level. But this, so so this. In the cedar level, it's quite coarse, you know. Ah, you know, like when people people give up smoking and they see people smoke, ah, it's, it's so gross, you know, that, that kind of, you know. Or or someone who's who's been very o overweight and then they lose all the weight. They put a lot of effort into losing weight and then they what, and they just can't bear it when they see all oh, those self-indulgent, obese people. Why don't they pull themselves together? You know, so gross and disgusting. You know, that, so we create this kind of, uh, it's just something to, it's normal and natural, you know, but something to, to recognize and to let go of. And to, yeah. Anybody else? Please Honor. take the mic from me. <laughs> Thank you for coming here today. Uh, this is all pretty new to me. And um, I grew up studying Taekwondo and learning how to, how to meditate at a very young age. So it's coming pretty easily to me. However, I'm a little bit of a news junkie and we live in a violent world right now. And I'm just curious to know uh, from what my wife has exposed me to, it seems to be very peaceful and very loving. However, I'm having a hard time reconciling the monks in Burma 
and the violence that's going on there now, along with the Shaolin monks who practice martial arts. I was wondering if you could just try to explain what's going on there to a layman. Okay, yeah. Well, it, um, the different schools of Buddhism and different ideas of what a monk is and what a monk's role uh, is or should be. So uh, I'll try to simplify as much as possible. In this school of Buddhism, uh, which uh, called Theravada, which we find in Thailand and Sri Lanka and Cambodia and Burma and so on. The idea of the monastic order has traditionally been that the monastic order is a unifier in the society, that monks don't take on any uh, political affiliation, they don't make overt political statements, they don't identify themselves with political parties or even social reform parties. Um, and one reason uh, for that is that people of every political persuasion can come to the monastery. So whether they're uh, rich or poor or uh, Republican or Democrat or red or yellow or whatever, then the idea is the moment you walk in the monastery, you put all that, you leave all that at the gate and you're all Buddhists, you're all students of, 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 of the Buddha or of the Dhamma. That's, that's the ideal. Now, you could see what would happen if monks become identified with a particular political party or a political program. Then all those people who um, were affiliated with different political parties would feel alienated from the Sangha. Um, and perhaps if they got in power, they might see that the monastic order was a danger to them, might start passing laws to suppress the monastic order. So in the long term, it would be very dangerous for the institution, the monastic institution, to be involved in politics. Plus, of course, it, it would probably be the case that in a monastery, uh, not everybody would have the same political views. So, you know, the abbot might be a Democrat and the, and the vice abbot a Republican, you know, and you'd have everything would become very uh, conflicted and the monastic harmony would, would fall apart. Um, but that's not to say that monks uh, should not stand up for Buddhist values, but they speak more on a general level. This is, this is the Buddha. The Buddha said that violence is always wrong and there's no such thing as the means justifies the ends in Buddhist teachings and whatever your justification should be, uh, hurting others is always wrong. And, and so people can take this and apply it to particular situations. Now, this role of the Sangha in, or the monastic order in society has been pretty well upheld in Thailand uh, for the past many hundred years. Um, and that's um, due largely to the close relationship between the monastic order and the monarchy. Um, and secondly, and most importantly, I would think, is that Thailand never became a colony of any of the Western powers. What is now Cambodia, Vietnam, Laos um, became French colonies, um, Burma, Malaysia, um, Sri Lanka, India were all British colonies. Thailand was a buffer between them. In those other countries, the relationship between the secular power and the Sangha was cut. And in some cases, um, particularly in Sri Lanka, um, there was a, um, a repression of Buddhism, quite a violent repression, uh, first by the Portuguese and then by the Dutch before the British took over in the 19th century. And British are a lot more you know, sort of indirect, and, um, you know, if you wanted a good job, then you have to become a Christian or, or whatever, but they don't actually make you do that. But when the, you know, the time became ripe for independence movements uh, to throw out the colonial powers, inevitably people looked to the leaders, the historical leaders of the society, which were the monks. So in Sri Lanka and Burma, the monks were leaders of the independence movement and attained a, a political role um, which uh, they didn't relinquish after independence. And also the idea of what a monk should be, how a monk should behave, was very much conditioned by that. So 
um, the for lay Buddhists in Sri Lanka or Burma, um, monks being involved in political protests and so on is quite normal and, and they're accepted by them. And it's not in Thailand. So there was a kind of weird situation, you remember a few years ago, where the Burmese monks were on the streets um, protesting against the military government and were being beaten up and tortured and killed. And people all over the world were horrified by that and were calling upon the Burmese. And yet, how is it that the Buddhist country next door to Burma, same school of Buddhism, same kind of Buddhism, almost completely quiet? Um, and you know, part of that was for more political reasons. But on the part of Buddhists, it's just that lay Buddhists in Thailand just feel, what are those monks doing? That's not their role. That's not their job. Monks shouldn't be doing that. So once you get into that world, then that's the kind of thing that happens to you. So there was a sense of compassion and, and for the monks individually. Um, but this lack of, of, of um, sympathy for their methods because of the idea of Sangha and, and the role of a monk, uh, which um, was in fact laid down by the Buddha and as for various social, historical, cultural reasons being uh, able to be upheld in Thailand as is not in those other countries. So that, that's the difference between Thailand and Burma. As far as Shaolin, and, and this is a different school of Buddhism, and the Shaolin temple is, is a bit kind of unique anyway. You know, it's become sort of an entertainment industry in many ways around the world. And, um, but in, in the, the, this school of Buddhism, then monks being involved in martial art training and, and giving martial arts performances around the world and so on, that, that would be considered to be, uh, um, would be breaking the, the monk's precepts and, and we, wouldn't, uh, we wouldn't do that. So there, there are different schools of Buddhism and different sects and different um, ideas of Buddhist monasticism is, is a big, uh, big topic. Um, I wanted to ask you a question about uh, intense emotions. Because I can't see where, who am I talking I'm here. to? Oh, yes. Yeah, okay. Um, you touched upon negative mental states quite a bit this evening. And um, with regards to people that suffer from clinical depression mm. and uh, borderline BDP, borderline. well, it's a, basically there's an organic brain disorder and I wonder what your thoughts were, or would you be saying that the mind is more powerful and therefore the brain can, or the cortex, uh, would therefore be able to control the amygdala, which results in yeah. these sort of borderline disorders? Well, uh, I think that a lot of the research on... Um, Recent research on neuroplasticity made possible by development of um, fMRI technology and so on um, has supports the Buddhist view that this is there is a two way movement here. Certainly, you can't deny that um, uh, brain damage, say through accident, through an accident or genetic or whatever will have an effect on the mind. But the mind is not merely, you know, a byproduct or an ep what they call epiphenomena um, of the chemical changes in the brain. And the mental training um, has an effect on both the structure and the, the uh, function of the brain. Uh, for instance, um, the, the frontal cortex you're referring to um, thins, the, the thins through age. Um, and what they found is that um, med people have been meditating from a young age. Um, their cortex, the thickness of their cortex at 60 is equivalent to the cortex of a non-meditator at 40. So this is a um, this where the thinning of the cortex is affected by 
meditation. This is one of many, many um, cases. The um, yeah, so there are there are all kinds of, of, of studies going on now with long term meditators, Tibetan monks involved in these brain uh, brain scans and seeing how uh, cultivation of positive emotions can, and meditation can affect um, mood and and uh, brain function. The you're probably aware of the um, what do they call SSR? Is the the mood um, affecting meditation? SSRI that um, you can get this the compared with the effect of placebo um, placebo affects 80% of the effect of those medicines um, which suggests that a lot of it is coming from the mind rather than the brain and I think that you know that idea that the brain is like this therefore the mind is like that doesn't stand up to um, to analysis um, and that we know on moving away from the brain a bit that um, if we're very stressed out and tense or worried, um, then that has an effect on our immune system or it can create, or very simply some people get, when they get very stressed out, then they get diarrhea, for instance. I mean, this is a physical phenomena being affected by it. It is so common and obvious, you know, that um, happens again and again that our, our mental states affect our physiology. Um, that 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 um, first the brain and one of the reasons why this uh, secular mindfulness movement is is um, expanding um, so rapidly and is is being accepted in so many different fields now is due to um, certain medical studies and one of, one of them published I think in Britain originally um, compared different treatments of depression and in uh, like an initial bout of depression first depression then the different kinds of treatments whether the medic uh, drugs or therapy or so on pretty much the same but where you see huge differences in chronic depression and in chronic depression um, the uh, the treatment called MBCT mindfulness based cognitive therapy um, is way more effective than any other treatment. Um, so, and so, and it's the clinical trial, the clinical tests of this uh, now out there, peer reviewed, and it's, it's generally accepted that this is, um, you know, not some Buddhist or some radical theory, but it, there's hard um, evidence supporting this. So this is a, a mindfulness-based approach to depression. Uh, which has measurable um, and quite uh, remarkable effects on on incidents of chronic depression. So I would say that's you know one one reason, it, and I think it's one that gives us a lot of hope that you know we're not the prisoner of our chemicals, as it were. And even with genes, I mean, the you know there's this there's, there's there's there was a period, wasn't there, where we're getting into this very mechanistic kind of idea: we are our genes, and you know, you've got because you've got this gene, and this happens, and you. Know, but um, now the, I mean, I'm not say claim to be a scientist, but from what I've, what I gather, um, they found now a simple analogy would be like genes have an off and on switch, and the way your surroundings and your upbringing and so on determine or condition whether or not that gene is switched on. So it's not they say because you've got such a gene, you're going to be this way or that way, and. One one experiment that I did read about it was before they don't do these experiments on, on on humans. Obviously, it's done on rhesus monkeys, where there is a one particular genetic mutation, and rhesus monkeys who have this genetic mutation tend to act in very aggressive ways. So they they got a number of these these monkeys, and in one the one group um, they were given very warm and and close maternal affection and attention and the others were abandoned and lacked that kind of affection in the first two months of their life the ones that lacked affection and touching is very important um, 
they they went on to manifest these aggressive tendencies whereas the rhesus monkeys who were surrounded with love and affection and touching and and so on in the first couple of months of their life didn't even though they had the same genes so so these these kinds of studies are coming out more and more now to show that it's um, is this mixture of what called nature and nurture this it's not just one or the other